Ondering is really quite ferocious. It's when a huckster takes some lies and makes them sound precocious by saying them in Congress or a mainstream outlet. So, disinformation's origins are slightly less atrocious. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. It's how you hide a little. Feeder kid occupied government. Feeder kid occupied government. Buddy, you're a boy, make a big knife playing in the street. Go Feeder kid occupied government. Feeder kid occupied government. That is absolutely unacceptable. How dare you uh, 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 attack the physical fan, appearance Russell's of another fan. person? Are your Move feelings hurt? her words down. Aww. Oh, oh, girl, baby girl. Oh, really? Don't even play, baby girl. Gonna, I don't think We are going to move, and we're going to take your words down. Thank I you second that motion. Every single day to lift working people out from under the boots of greed, trampling on our way of life. Feeder kid occupied government. Feeder kid occupied. Feeder kid occupied government. 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 Uh, theater kid occupied government. Getting women of color in the, in the United States of America. Don't tell me because I didn't get a single apology. Time has expired. My life was threatened. Thank you. Uh, theater kid theater kid occupied government. Who's there? It's theater kid occupied gov. Theater kid occupied government. Theater kid occupied government. Ten dollar founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being hello it's me from the future i'm now done with this monologue and realize that the first half was just bullying theater kids and the second half was more informative do with this information what you will choose your own experience viewer click now i'm not gonna put up a timestamp. maybe i will i don't know I guess we'll have to talk to me from the future about that. This is me from the future, but not the future future. Okay, resuming video. <clears throat> Theater kid occupied government. My first the last call word. is to Prime Minister of New Zealand, who said that her goal is to make New Zealand the place where it's the best place in the world for a child to grow up. And I will tell her girlfriend you are so wrong, because the United States... Theater kid occupied government. Theater kid occupied government. Theater kid occupied government. Theater kid occupied government. What is a theater kid? Like all things obscene, you just kind of know it when you see it. Tell me more, tell me more. These are not my people. This is not how you behave in a Denny's or anywhere for that matter. Which way, Western man, you must quickly choose. What's up? What's up? What the fuck's up, Denny's? For my entire life, if I really look back on everything, my true enemy has always been theater kids. I mean, every time I tried to do something funny or cool or whatever, there were always theater kids there to like henpeck me into not making America great again. I mean, they never shut up. They're so undeservedly narcissistic. They're suck ups, teachers, pets, like the worst thing to ever happen basically. But putting that to the side for a second, you should know Content forecast is showing content en route to your area, including a multi-part series, which I have prepared on the election, but then I was watching the coverage from the DNC and I thought, okay, let's just get this out really quick. So yes, these are the people who rule you. This is the ascendant stock of people, the theater kids. These are the traits that are selected for and rewarded for every one that you see that's put on camera, put on stage. There's like a hundred more operating behind the scenes, cut from the same cloth. This is what theater kid occupied government looks like. And so I thought we should explain it because it is actually very useful in understanding what's been going on, especially within the last while or so, because it provides a very accurate understanding of the kind of person we're up against, more importantly, the mechanics of how they are recruited and able to operate against us, patriots. So it's good to understand these people because they're not all leftists. They're not even all ideologically aligned. They're not motivated by the same issues in general, but there is a type. And once you see it, you cannot unsee it. There is a profile for this kind of person. So we're going to talk about what these are, where they come from, how they're a perfect 
perfect model for the kind of person that we're up against, how they fit right into the mechanisms of anti-patriot power. I basically want to explain how and why it is the case that we are governed by these types of people who are so stupid and annoying and obnoxious because there is actually like a very good reason for it. Um, it's just Bolshevism all over again. So we're going to get into some history as well. But you are seeing more of this. You are seeing like more articles talking about the ascent of the theater kid. Like they seem to be aware that this is happening. Of course, they think it's like the coolest freaking thing ever. And I'm telling you, you thought the last 60 years were bad. You just wait. I mean, as the ascent of the theater kid continues into the political class, it's just going to get so much worse. But first, let's wind the clocks back. You understand what I'm talking about? Like, are we all on the same page here with theater kid? I mean, this is like the stock of person who is ruling us. You know, there's a song by Bowling for Soup called High School Never Ends. And as it would turn out, that's actually like a real thing. Not only is everyone's behavior pretty much the same, but if somebody had like a bad experience in high school, they will never live it down and it will become the source of their drive for like the rest of their lives. And I unironically believe that whether somebody had fun between the time they were like 10 and 20, that will predict like the next several decades of their behavior. And I'm not talking about like, oh, peaking in high school. I'm just talking about whether you had a good time. You just enjoyed a time in your life, which is so crucial to your social and overall development as a person. Uh, I don't know. I've noticed the people who didn't or they, they don't. I mean, they develop this kind of like chip on their shoulder that never really goes away, never really live it down. Theater kids, especially. Even if they had a good time in their like little theater kid group, they always will make some reference to some variation of a story where like a normal white guy traumatizes them and ruins their lives, something like that. It's just, you know, part of the struggle session is how they display membership. There's always a reason to, uh, to hate the normal white guy, right? I get it. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. Uh, we're usually quite nice and pleasant, but you know, I get it. It doesn't have to inform everything you do for the rest of your lives, but sometimes it's more convenient. That's fine. But you do have to ask yourself even before that, like, why did they become theater kids in the first place? Because regardless of activity, any group of relatively normal guys or girls, they're going to impose certain standards on conduct, right? Like if you step out of line, you're going to be corrected or ostracized. Uh, this is what people call bullying. It's a very important process for your development. Antisocial behaviors are not tolerated by normal people. This is good. It's not a coincidence that during the era of anti-bullying, we have spawned the most like bizarre antisocial generation in the history of mankind. So if you're a freak, you can't quite fit in anywhere else. Maybe you go join the theater kids. I mean, everyone there is androgynous. There's no regulation of behavior. It's like the island of misfit toys. And by the way, I'm not denigrating people for not having friends. I get it. Sometimes things don't work out. Things are awkward. It's hard to navigate. That's fine. I'm just saying, I know a lot of guys who chose to eat lunch alone rather than to hang out with the theater kids. And there's like a nobility in that. That is unironically the difference. Like being able to be content by yourself versus needing to belong somewhere so you debase yourself by hanging out with the freak show. Because when you're hanging out with the theater kids, I mean, every behavior is tolerated. Like the only thing that is not tolerated is expressing like anti-weird sentiment. Only intolerance is not tolerated. That's why the theater kids are rainbow people, furries, weebs, feminist girl bosses. Like it's all there. Misery loves company and they get together and they just breed weird traits like a virus. If you're hanging out with the theater kids, everything is tolerated except for not tolerating other people's like insane behavior. That is a rule only for insane groups of people. I mean, no one would ever think to have that rule, uh, even if just unspoken. So I don't know like what the chicken versus egg is looking like there. I'm sure they just create a feedback loop together. Like, you know, you get involved because maybe you're a little weird, maybe you're a little antisocial, and then it just grooms you into becoming even worse. It amplifies the characteristics of its host. And most of the kids are gay, and then the director's usually gay, and then the director like develops a weird relationship with the kids. I don't know. Maybe this is all just like going totally over. If you've been in high school in the last 10 years, you must understand what I'm talking about. But I think there's even more to it as to like why they are the perfect volunteers and henchmen for the regime as theater kids. Like I remember Schopenhauer wrote that actors usually develop madness most frequently because they spend all their time, you know, learning these new parts, becoming new people, memorizing other people's dialogue without any grounding or connection to each other, or maybe they're even in direct contradiction to each other. And so like every night they're just spending their time trying to become these new people and in the process, perhaps forgetting themselves and things of that nature will tend to lead to madness over time. I think there's some truth to that, but then you kind of have to wonder, okay, well, what way is that going? Like, is it the acting that makes the man soulless or are the soulless 
journalists drawn to acting, to the act of simulating what it's like to be someone other than themselves or just to be someone in general, understanding these characters perhaps better than themselves, or maybe there's nothing even about themselves there to understand. They're just like total NPCs. You know, they are themselves soulless. Like these people are perfectly susceptible to programming. They are the NPCs. You know, the Romans thought too, the Romans thought that acting was a shameful and illegitimate profession. They regarded them similarly to uh, prostitutes and to criminals, and they were barred from participating in political life. You know, the Romans kind of tried to warn us about uh, the ascent of the theater kid. And so not all of our enemies are theater kids, but more and more they are becoming theater kids. You know, I guess there's sort of a new development maybe. I tried explaining a theater kid to my dad. He just thought it meant like a regular gay kid, good instincts. But I don't know, man, anyone who's been in high school in the last 15, 20 years, you have to know exactly what we're talking about here. It's like if you took the civil rights regime and then the gynocracy and then like gay people and then you just like mush it all together. This is what we're talking about. It's like the incompetence of the civil rights regime. It's the passive aggression and the condescension and the vapidity of the gynocracy and then like the flamboyance of state enforced homosexuality. Like that is basically what it is. That is what theater kid occupied government is. So the good news is that our enemies are incompetent, maladjusted freaks. The bad news is that they've got nothing to lose. They've got nothing else going for them and they will die before they go back to working at Starbucks. So these kids come up in like an education system, which is basically designed to reward mediocrity, celebrate all forms of expression as equally good and valid and artistic, whatever. And then they think this makes them special. They usually develop a weird relationship with whichever English teacher is the gayest. And then they get mad at you, normal American, because you're like kind of stumbling through life, just having fun, succeeding anyway, being an idiot with your friends. And uh, they hate you for this forever. They hate that you can just kind of go about your business and become happy and successful while goofing off uh, because you're just living on your own terms because you're a normal American patriot. By the way, speaking of which, normal American patriots, you know what? I almost forgot. In honor of White Boy Summer, our cool friends over at Undertack are giving you the chance to win a literal Jeep Gladiator plus $30,000 in cash. Okay, what's the catch? Doyle. All right, smart guy. I knew I liked you. First, you just buy clothes that are cool and high quality. All you have to do is stop wearing underwear that leaks chemicals into your skin and balls. But okay, I understand. Whoa, what good is a Jeep going to do if I can't listen to racist podcasts while I drive? Okay, fine. Choosers get to be beggars. If you go place an order right now at Undertack.com, I I will release another video exactly one week from today. It will be a big, beautiful video. You'll say it's maybe the best ever. Are you even listening? What are we talking about here? Pragmatism, prudence, working towards a goal. How do we get there? I'm laying out for you two options right now. Option A, self-respect, more content, cool underwear from one of our cool friends. Option B, incremental chemical castration from whatever crap you're wearing now, which aside from that, it's not even cool and not even made by one of our cool friends. So there's that. Um, they even have stuff for women. Our seven percenters, we cherish our seven percenters. We'll never forget about them. Every dollar you spend with code Doyle Win gets you one entry plus 10% off your entire order. That's Doyle Win. That's the code. One word, no spaces. I am ordering all Doyleists to fall in line on this one. It's literally free money. This is improving your immediate situation. This is manifest destiny. This is the pioneering spirit. What do you think this means? RIP President Washington, you would have loved Undertack. Frankly, it's fiscal irresponsibility if you do not heed my advice and consume this product right now. By the way, full disclosure, I have no stake in this. I don't get a chance to win the truck. I don't get a chance to win the money. Here's the thing that like somebody is going to win it and I will be damned if that somebody is just some random idiot and not a doy boy. So go ahead, stock up for the rest of your life. That is undertack.com. Offer code Doyle win. That is undertack.com. U N D E R T A C.com with the code Doyle win. See the site for details. Link in the description. Very epic. We continue. I'm telling you white males way up white males through the roof. Okay, let us continue our very important discussion, the theater kid to Congress pipeline. So basically, the theater kids, they're like the weird kids. They do relatively well in school, 110 IQ, give or take. I don't mean nerds, by the way. The whole nerd versus jock thing, that's not real. That's something that people say online to try to live down having had a poor experience in high school, the theater kids, which of course they'll never live down. And you see this in Hollywood too, of course. You know, you've got like the same thing. It's people who have a bone to pick with jocks realizing that if they tell the story honestly, it just kind of makes them seem jealous and bitter and 
so they exaggerate and pretend that they're just bullies and it's because they're actually the insecure ones. Chad is actually insecure and I'm not. I'm a screenwriter and I'm definitely not mad. Okay, dude. So yeah, not only is that inaccurate, it's not even real. Like you don't have to be either or. You have to be both of those things. You need to be strong. You need to be in shape. You need to be capable of lifting and running and fighting. And you also need to have obsessions that animate you to the point of like making those around you confused or uncomfortable. I mean, this is what it means to be alive. And you can't fake that. Some people will never have anything to do with that. Most people are going to go through their lives faking that and trying to display that to others. That's what people mean when they say nerd, by the way. But the real problem is actually the theater kids who simply pretend to be nerds. Like in my experience, guys who are actual nerds get along pretty much fine with guys who are chads or frat bros or whatever because they both accomplish things. And so there's like a natural alliance formed between them against the theater kid who only pretends and nags and tries to make everything annoying and gay and all about themselves. That's like a common misconception I see. People are always like, oh, we're run by nerds. Nerds are actually good at things and interesting because they have these obscure interests and hobbies and eccentricities which they obsess over. The problem we have is that we are run by theater kids who are far less intelligent than nerds, even many chads, but they still somehow possess the confidence and narcissism of the chads, even though they're like completely not the same. It's totally unearned. They're totally incompetent. So it's a very dangerous set of traits to possess. And even now, you don't even have nerds anymore. Like when you're saying that, you are referring to iPad kids. We've definitely got iPad kids. And dude, honestly, like even the iPad kids, like the genuinely weird kids, those are like the best people. If there's one thing I miss, it's getting to see iPad kids every day. Because one, like they're wildly entertaining to observe. And two, even then, it's like, at least you're authentic. Like, that's who they are. That's the real article. There's no gimmick there. They are just weird. Like, hell yeah, dude. Only walk backwards. Refuse to drink water because you think it's poison. Try buying guns online using the school laptop. Like, who cares? That's, do your thing, you know? Theater kids, however, they just LARP. They LARP. They convert attention into energy like a plant does with sunlight. As such, they never shut up. They never stop making noise. They never, they sing, they just make noise. And yeah, there are variants of this, of course, like with anything. Remember the political kid? It's the same thing. It's all variants of the same virus that infects our institutions. The political kid, you know exactly who I'm talking about. They wear the suits to school. They meet with the local random politicians and they post the photos so they can post their prepared generic statement on social media in between everyone else just posting like normal stuff because we're like 15. They get voted most likely to be president at the end of the year because everyone's like, oh yeah, who's that? kid who never shut the f up about politics. Yeah. And then they write him in, you know, I understand I'm walking on a tightrope right now, by the way. So I have to be careful that no one in the wonderful audience ends up in the splash zone here. We don't want anyone catching any strays. When I say talking about politics, I don't mean arguing with teachers, owning your libtard classmates. There is nobility in that, but there is a specific type of kid who makes politics by itself their whole personality, but not like in, in an antagonizing way, like you'd be doing by arguing with teachers, reciting silly statistics during a class presentation. I'm talking about kids who just think like politics by itself is cool. Like it's something cool all by itself. They'd make it their whole personality and everybody had to know about it. Not history, not warfare, not our country's history, even statesmanship, nothing like that. Literally just politics as an activity. These are the kids who would listen to NPR and think that writing policy for a congressman someday would be like the coolest freaking thing ever. Not because they care about the policy. They have no conviction. They have no vision. But because they get to work in freaking D.C. and it'll be just like West Wing or Veep. I thank God I never ended up like that. You know, I was voted most likely to protest, which is much different. And that is because I put up a poster at the school calling Bill Clinton a rapist because Alex Jones told me to. So it's just a totally, totally different ball game. But yes, these are the theater kids who go on to occupy occupy our government. And I always got along with nerds. I will say, you know, I always got along with jocks. I got along with everybody. My job was to get along with people. Okay. Also, nobody uses the word jock anymore. That's not a real word. Theater kids say that when they're trying to talk about their high school trauma fantasies. I guess you'd say like frat boys now or something. Chads is what we've been using. I'm not quite sure where I fit in on that spectrum. You know, one of my best friends with the, uh, was the president of a frat at like the biggest party school in Michigan. So I spent some time up there with him. Uh, I played sports. I got my letter sophomore year, but I'm definitely a nerd. But, you know, I was friends with everybody. We got along great. We get along with people. The only people I've consistently never gotten along with have been theater kids. Even my biggest detractors will often say, how does John Doyle look like such a nerd and such a chat at the same time? Hey, 
Embrace the third position. I don't know. I'm simply, I'm built different. Transcend the false binary. You just have to not be a theater kid. That's your job. Just simply do not be a theater kid. Being a theater kid means that your entire life is a LARP. You're just playing a role. You don't do anything, but you try to convince people that you're doing things or you have depth. Like they pretend to care about things that nobody actually cares about because they want to seem deep. Like, oh, I just love Amy Klobuchar's transportation policy. Shut up. No, you don't. You don't have a train set. You're not an autist. You're going to make me gatekeep autism. You know, this has been going on for a while. People, of course, online, they want to LARP as a bunch of different stuff, but people really enjoy LARPing, particularly as autists or nerds or like general outsiders, but it's just to bring attention to themselves and what they're doing, which is so quirky and unique and it's never been done before. OMG, look, I just like went to a bookstore. I bought all these books. I think I might be autistic. I'm like, no, shut up. If you're posting anything other than the thing, not you, not you and the thing, not your relation to the thing. You're not an autist. You're just a woman. Like you're not atypical. You are being perfectly typical for a woman. The thing may be different. This book, that book, whatever. The behavior is identical. Needing to present the thing. Dad, look, dad, look, dad, look what I did. Dad, look. It's like, it's the same thing. You can't just become an autist or a nerd or whatever, because that's only driven by an obsession and a passion, which theater kids just don't have. And they never will have it. And they really do resent that, among many other things. Like that they can't just meme themselves into having genuine depth or competence or even status. Like if they dedicate themselves to simply listening to a certain number of minutes of a news podcast or reading a certain number of pages of an airport book. Like if they just simply put the right fuel in the car, it'll have the same performance as an Aston Martin. But usually they don't, they don't even go to that extent. They don't even actually fuel the car. They just like take pictures of it, like at the gas station, so to speak. I don't know. They go to bookstores. They listen to podcasts. They have a degree. They have a degree in political science. They have an MPP. Okay, I know you posted all of it. Like, you notice they can never explain anything either uh, that would be implied by that degree or by that, you know, reading habit allegedly or the credentialism. So the credentialism itself does all the heavy lifting. Just like I have a degree, respect that. And then they get frustrated when you don't automatically respect that or take them seriously because they have some BS degree. They get offended if you ask them to explain or substantiate these things in their own words. They sometimes throw out some excuse like, well, you need to educate yourself. You're not entitled to my knowledge or whatever. Whereas people who are actually obsessive and have genuine passion for things, they will like gladly, please give them the opportunity. Please give them permission to go off and explain these things. But theater kids are not driven by that. They're not driven by passion. They are driven by resentment, permanent chip on the shoulder, incessant self-promotion, very much undeserved narcissism. Some of the characteristics of a theater kid. Yeah. Okay. So they're unexceptional, unstable, unattractive, and not just physically necessarily, though most are, I mean like repulsive. They all have BPD or some other personality disorder. They're unhappy. Uh, they fixate on the credentials, which are just like status tokens from the regime. They're not really shy. They're not really quiet. But that would be like almost preferable. Like they just won't ever shut up. They're always making noise. Like 110 IQ, give or take. They just exist to self-promote, show everybody how cool it is. They're so obsessed with their story, their arc. It's like their whole self-mythologizing habit, which of course as theater kids, as actors, they think they're the protagonist. They're the disruptor. They're the revolutionary. They drive the action. They set the frame. Everybody else is just reacting. It's Dumbledore's army. It's the resistance. It's all of that. Also, they speak like cartoon characters. They have like three or four voices, the cartoon character, and then when they're giving information, they are the kindergarten teachers. Uh, when they are being disagreeable, they are black women. And then when they're giving information to a crowd, they are black preachers. That's actually true. Like a theater kid, they cannot help but fall into the MLK uh, preacher cadence when they speak into a microphone for more than like 15 seconds. AOC just did this the other day. It's like a thing. I don't know. They, they think, they want to speak how they think black people speak, but black people don't actually speak that way. AOC, she does this whole theater kid routine in public. She puts out a statement. Fox News is big mad. Okay, first of all, literally shadow boxing against Fox News. Even their antagonists in their stories are like fake. Who cares what Fox News thinks about anything? Nobody has cared about that in quite some time. That's like a 2000s era enemy, which I guess just hasn't been updated yet, something like that. Also, big mad, nobody has ever said that, except for theater kids who think that's how black people speak. This whole statement too, just completely wrong. Now, I am of course a black person expert, but more than that, I'm humble and I know my limits. So I actually brought in an outside consultant, my black cousin who's made appearances before, some of you may remember, uh, to tell me exactly sort of how a black person would actually say that statement. So let's all sit down and listen together. All right, so you could do some like, uh, some like, 
Fox News, them suits, man, they ain't, they ain't with the people. They ain't for the people. They just for themselves, something like that. And then for the Bronx thing, you could do... Basically, you could just do, like, an exclamation point of a black man, like, man, we had 12, man, we had, like, 1,200 up in the Bronx, you know what I'm saying, trying to get these out, like, get out and vote, you know what I'm saying, that shit free, and it don't cost you none, and, uh, what else, say, like, yeah, get some on these phones, man, call, call up your granny, take your granny to vote, get out to vote, you know what I'm saying, something like that and then it's called organizing okay you could just refer to organizing as like another family reunion and then just i don't know black people have a hard time referencing the internet especially if it's a link so you could just say like hey yo go on google <laughs> just like well, there you have it. As you can see, not even close, but they love doing this. They cannot help themselves but to mimic the language of the lower classes as part of their whole communist LARP. But then they end up just speaking like black people, but not like actual black people, specifically how only they think black people speak. So they use language like homies, folks, etc. It's all a LARP, you know, shouts out to my trans homies. Like, what are you saying? It do be like that sometimes. Like, they don't understand that's how black people speak. They literally just think it's like a funny way to talk. And they're like, oh, that, that looks like fun. I want to try. You must understand, Patriot, the way that you felt when you saw Hulk Hogan cut a live promo in support of Donald Trump and basically threatened to, like, leg drop these people on the South Lawn, that is how libtards feel when they see a minority committing a crime. That is how they feel about George Floyd and Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin. That's how they feel when they see someone trying to, like, speak like a black preacher. They think it's, like, the coolest thing ever. They've got this uncontrollable impulse to identify with the lower classes while simultaneously distancing themselves from everything deemed to be low status, which is counterintuitive, though possible. That is possible to do. It's fascinating, right? That's how you take a knee in public before acknowledging crime data, which totally disproves your entire worldview. It can be high status to adopt or mimic certain low class behaviors, as these people often enjoy doing, usually because it makes normal Americans mad. And that's a good thing to do. They're rewarded for doing that. It is high status to do that. It's almost always high status to annoy the sensibilities of normal white American Christians, even if the behavior itself that you are doing that with is low class. And ironically, the thing about them that is most authentically or accurately low class is their obsession with signaling that they're definitely not low class. That sort of status anxiety, constantly fixating on credentials, avoiding low status ideas like they're the plague, being literally anxious, physically anxious about these ideas. That's the only thing that's like really low class about them in the sense of trying to match behavior. Um, that and mythologizing their own existence, always having a chip on their shoulder, never living down their past, their trauma or whatever. You ever hang around like actually low-class people? You peruse their social media? It's all they focus on. What's going on? Who said what about whom? Why is she doing this? Blah, blah, blah. Like they're just always, everyone's always after me, my haters. Like they could go on for hours and hours and hours as they do for their entire lives. But yes, I'm curious about the sort of apparatchiks of the regime, the theater kids, basically the people ruling you right now. You don't have to be a person who, as a kid, was involved with theater to be a theater kid. If you're a fan of stage production, you were involved in it, that doesn't automatically make you a theater kid. There are plenty of theater kids who have never stepped foot into an auditorium. Being a theater kid is a state of being. It's a virus. But theater kids, student government, forensics, model UN, it's all the same thing for the most part. Judge it by the fruits. And the fruits are literally like fruits for the most part. There are, of course, exceptions like there are with anything. But if you're involved in these things, and if anything, you should understand how true this is. Like, I'm not making this up. And different groups of people have different traits. We know that. So some groups are more likely to be theater kids than other groups. Um, but generally speaking, these people are highly neurotic. The men are effeminate. The women are type A, like 95 to 120 IQ. They're not charismatic. They're not actually good speakers. We've gone over how they speak, but yet they still have power. I've been told my whole life that some obscure Austrian painter only got himself into power because he was such a good speaker. 
I don't know. I mean, they still, they maintain the power regardless. But yeah, they also have this desire to change the world, which means just post pictures of themselves working on the hill, basically. Because remember, they're the protagonists. This is but the second act. And no one actually believes this, by the way. No one actually believes that our institutions are competent in the sense that they actually represent people. But there's still this desire to get involved, but not to radically change, just to be like in proximity. They don't actually want to help Americans. They don't want to help Americans have better lives. If they're honest enough, they'll tell you that they basically just want to accelerate the looting of the empire, the transfer of wealth from the tax chattel, from American patriots to the equatorial Americans, all these new Americans, all these new people who flood into the country. And so I think the impulse behind getting involved is very important. Uh, it tells you a lot about what their motivations are, especially you know when you're looking at the right-wing theater kids. Like in the last decade or so, People getting involved because of Trump, because you want to change things, you actually care versus the forensics kids, the model UN kids who just care about like respectability or process because it makes them feel important. Like that's the key distinction. If you're involved because the direction things are going is inspiring to you versus you're involved because you just want to be gay. Like you saw something big and gay and evil going on and you're like, oh, that looks like fun. I, I want to turn. And it really cannot be overstated how much Donald Trump made these people reveal themselves. It's as though someone's phone went off during the show and they just refused to silence it. And the theater kids are just eternally mad. The big night's ruined because it really made people understand just how much like the suit and tie conservatives absolutely hate the average Republican voter. They are physically made anxious by the same ideas that inspire and excite their voters, especially nationalism. You know, I remember reading tweets from these people in 2015 when Trump would lead in some poll or caucus and they'd literally tweet out like, oh, glad they could stop taking opiates and, and for a second and show support. I don't think anyone really understood just how ingrained that hatred was until Donald Trump basically like forced them to reveal it because they couldn't help themselves but just vomit it all out because they were so neurotic they never thought they'd actually have to hand a disruption. The show was just supposed to go on forever, right? But Trump shows up in 2015 and he can actually disrupt things. Now all of a sudden you've got guys like David French, who before Donald Trump, David French was considered to be like the farthest right figure in the broader conversation. But after Trump shows up, he pretty much just like immediately reveals himself uh, to want to ally with leftists where he's been ever since among many others who have had their minds literally destroyed by Donald Trump. Always easy to align yourself with the establishment, right? They align themselves with the establishment and against Trump. And of course, the establishment doesn't care what the reason for doing so is. They're just happy to have them and they do have them completely. I mean, they're completely controlled. All these people, doesn't matter you know, what they claim their ideology is, what they claim their little main issues are. It's like they will align themselves with the establishment against normal Americans in an instant when presented with the opportunity to do so, which is exactly what they've done. Because at the end of the day, they have this fundamental belief in the system. Even if they claim to be radical, as you'll see liberals and leftists and neocons and libertarians they all have their own little thing. No, like they are attracted to the system because they have a desire to be attached to it. They have a desire to be a barnacle. Even in their most ambitious aspirations, they recognize that they're among the lowest forms of life. They don't want to get in and like change anything seriously. Again, even the most radical ones possess no beliefs which are themselves threatening to anybody, like even if they insist otherwise, which of course they have to. And they have to do this because, I mean, they require it. They they melt down when you come between them and their reward, when they feel like that's threatened. That's what we saw in 2016. It's what we've been seeing pretty much ever since because you are jeopardizing that reward. You are coming between them and their entire self-concept. The syndication of politics throughout all life as identities independent of the state, be those nation, uh, heritage, community, faith, family, all of that's been eroded as a matter of policy. That has spawned a generation of people who are like naked, freezing in the cold, they're confused. They can only find comfort in attaching themselves to the state and getting good boy points, you know, against the enemies of the state, which are you, normal American patriots, everything you believe, everything that you hold valuable, all that is low status because the screen people say so. And they will literally die before associating themselves with anything deemed low status. Freaking racism, freaking sexism, freaking nativism, no matter how edgy or autonomous they think they are or portray themselves as on social media, but if you try to talk to them about anything else, I swear to God, they literally start to squirm in their seats. They are physically made anxious by these things, like Danger Will Robinson, naughty idea. Not a single thing they believe is threatening or outside of an approved paradigm that has been installed into their consciousness. Their minds are nothing more than sandboxes for the CIA. And so, of course, the feeder kid has to be hypervigilant. 
against all outside threats, most aptly classified in the last few years as threats to democracy, right? And democracy just means like whatever gives the regime power. When they say our democracy, they don't mean that collectively. They mean that like possessively, like it's mine, it's ownership, it's their democracy. And democracy is just the word for the power structure that they've assembled. Like that's all that means. When you hear it that way, everything makes a lot more sense. If you take it at face value, you're just gonna be scratching your head. But part of what the theater kid has to do in order to believe, in order to justify digging deeper, is that some of the calls are coming from within inside the house. They're the protagonists, sure, but there are villains after them too. Even in the regime they occupy, isn't that mysterious? It's like the professor of the dark arts every year. The CIA leftist regime change organization, white supremacists, World War II German expats control the government. Whatever slop, they'll they'll just eat it right up. They just have to have some enemy to shadow box against to rationalize this like unrelenting action, which is really just caused by their resentment against normal American patriots. But is that really it? I mean, why do they do this? All these ants in DC, because it's not money. They're almost always broke. It's not extravagance. Their living conditions are resembling something between like a halfway house and a dormitory. It's not even really status. They're nobodies. But imagine how much worse it would be otherwise. That's the key. This is their best case scenario. Without it, what, do they go back to just working at Starbucks or something? I don't know. I mean, they need to use that public policy degree, right? Their talents surely are just being wasted at Starbucks. The theater kid must feel like she is important in playing a role. The role, of course, being decided by the regime, media, etc. Because the desire to climb is still there, right? That's like permanently ingrained in your nature. But they're NPCs. So the hierarchy is decided for them. They can't get off the plantation. They're too scared. They don't have it in them. The sense of self literally just comes from ascending like this hierarchy that is actually just fake and gay. And a lot of times being white is so low status. You notice that white theater kids will adopt these like coefficient identities, like bisexual or something, whatever that means, just to rid themselves of that mark by itself. It's like white with an asterisk. I mean, they're, they're hyper, hyper conscious of all that signaling and messaging. It affects them significantly. And people who aren't like this generally would not have an interest in getting involved in this whole arena. I mean, capable people generally do not enter politics, much less to be a career, unless they're doing so with the intention of being disruptive. Because the idea of doing so just to like participate Whatever, that, that would not appeal to them. They may have an interest, which is natural, of course, when you are a productive member of society with an actual stake in how things are run, but it's not like their thing. You know, the only kind of person who would romanticize politics, let alone at its current state, are total losers. Nobody of quality will look at the state of things and be like, wow, I just, I really just want to participate in that. That looks like just so great. And competence is not necessary. There's no accountability. If you're not elected, then no one's going to hold you accountable. Even if you are elected, no one's going to hold you accountable. But it's a, mat it's a matter of loyalty. So long as you are loyal, you don't even have to be a loyal person. You can be loyal to the regime. You know, so even if these people snake each other all the time, which they certainly do, they'll never snake the regime. Like the thought would literally never occur to them. It just keeps moving in the same direction, even if you know they bicker between themselves on the way there. And the best part is the more insane, the more maladjusted and evil and retarded and sheep-like you are, that just actually makes you a better candidate. The less able you are to do anything outside of serve the regime because you're a maladjusted, socially anxious freak, midwit theater kid, and you've got multiple prescription drugs on your person at all times, the more likely you are to be like loyal to the regime because like what other option do you have? I mean, also, you resent your opposites in the first place, normal American patriots. It's Cain and Abel. We know how this works. So yeah, you get to make their lives hell for the rest of their lives and it's paid for by their tax dollars. It's like, the best, I mean, that's a dream come true, right? It's a dream for what otherwise would be a nightmare existence for these miserable people. AOC, she would be bartending, which I have no problem with. I think that's actually a pretty cool job. But when you're a theater kid, you're too good for that. You're Belle. You're too good. There must be something more than this whatever life. It's all the same. Nobody recognizes how brilliant you are. And this fills you with rage. The entire thing is just a patronage network for the soulless, for the theater kids. They have no talent. They're not intelligent. They're not competent. They're not stable. They LARP. That is the value that they provide. That is what they are paid to do. Theater kids, girl bosses, sociopaths, these are the people who are rewarded. That's why when I hear theories about like corruption or blackmail, 
Those explanations are actually like too charitable by far. It's that you're being too nice to them. You're being way too generous to them because it almost implies a spine that has been compromised somehow. What if it never even existed in the first place? Think about what these people's lives are like. You don't really get to make money for the most part. You don't really get to have any power. You don't really get to have access to people who do have money and power besides, you know, occasionally rubbing shoulders. You don't really get to even do anything cool. And what you're a part of doesn't even like really work work. It's all just this big, incompetent, bureaucratic mess where accountability is impossible. It's all been constructed as a giant wealth transfer from the patriot taxpayers to these jobs that are created for people who are otherwise too incompetent to do anything else. And these jobs exist to what? Basically just do jack shit while the vultures and the hyenas like pick at the bones of our civilization. And then only when somebody tries to do something to stop it, does some department or agency or office, only then is someone actually going to look into their situation or something, right? That is the function. That's why big government exists. What kind of person gets involved in that? That's the theater kid. That is their identity by design. Their identity is the regime. And for the theater kid, being a part of that is all the better. That's all they have to to be. I mean, what else are they going to do? It's the only thing they can do. It's the only thing that validates them. Talk about pursuing something bigger than oneself. What if you can't? What if you were born to be an obnoxious retard and you're extremely neurotic and anxious all the time? Somehow this is all the fault of the like lax player who made the class laugh at you one time during your junior year. And so you dedicate like your entire life to burning the whole country down. That is these people. They are driven by that resentment. They're completely dysfunctional. They are status insecure because they understand that they're not actually gifted, even though they got like an A, an AP psych or whatever. And so their path upward is measured by their dedication and ability to make life more difficult for you specifically. This kind of system only works when you can plug people like that into it. People who could be successful in life, like independently of the state because they're intelligent, they're charismatic, maybe they're industrious, whatever it may be, they are not at least generally going to pledge loyalty to an establishment that has nothing to offer to them. So ironically, the only people who would pledge loyalty to this regime are the people who generally are the least talented. The competence crisis was like literally a choice and they'll work for free, maybe even pennies on the dollar. And sure, you know, a lot of money can be made in politics. You can climb the ladder. There are competent people here and there, but the majority of this is being done by the worker ants. And what drives them is resentment and a feeling of, you know, at least being, uh, I don't know, smarter, uh, more important than like their uncle who made fun of them one time at Thanksgiving. And the theater kid is one example but the entire project basically is this. The theater kid is like an avatar for how the whole thing works. They're like the personification of it. You know, winding the clocks back even further, this country was built upon the idea that aristocrats should govern, and they should govern when they are elected by productive and successful people who have stakes in society. That worked out pretty well for quite a long time. But what if you stop selecting for those people because they can't be trusted? What if you erect barricades for those people to stop them from entering the elite? Because they'll always have other options anyway, right? Because because they don't need you necessarily because they're better than you, but you hate them and you want to use them as tax chattel. So you instead recruit the worst people, people who can't even make it through the day without having a nervous breakdown, without having a panic attack. And you provide to them a sense of purpose and security in exchange for loyalty, blind loyalty, fanaticism. You give them a license to attack your enemy. You pay them to do it with money siphoned from your enemy. I mean, it's a brilliant idea, deeply sinister in nature. This is what Lenin did. Lenin didn't invent being a retard, but he did invent how to be a better retard. He's celebrated by these people, not because of communism, but because he was able to develop effective mechanisms for implementing it and consolidating its power. It's the same thing here now, even if we call it our democracy instead. Democracy is communism. It's literally the same thing. Our democracy, democratic socialism, it's literally all the same thing, you know, functionally. It might look a little bit different here or there, carry the four, whatever, who cares? Essentially, it is all the same thing. What it is saying is we all get to decide together what you get, what you do, and who you do it for. What is more communist and democratic than that? It, it is extremely both of those things. They speak like that all the time, and they mean it. So if anything, communism is just the principle of democracy manifested economically. But it's downstream from democracy, which is cringe. Uh, <laughs> he said the thing. The impulse itself is democratic from inception. 
because both democracy, communism, it all presupposes general human equality, which is a lie. And without that presupposition, it so much more obviously would never work, but that's what they believe. But the reason it works as a mechanism of consolidating power isn't because it actually works the way it was supposed to in theory, it's because it promises status to people who know deep down that they shouldn't have it. This is absolutely key for understanding our political class, because like we said, that doesn't hold you accountable to a particular ideology. You can believe whatever you want. You can be a communist, you can be a socialist, a social democrat, a neocon, a libertarian, a conservative, literally whatever you want, so long as ultimately you are serving the regime. You are aligning yourself with a regime that is hostile to patriots. That's why when push comes to shove, like we said, can't be overstated, when someone like Trump shows up in 2015, who can actually disrupt things. All of a sudden, you've got guys like David French, who before Trump, he was considered to be the farthest right guy. Yo, base David French. Now Trump shows up, and pretty soon, he quickly finds himself on the side of leftists, because he's not real opposition. He plays the role. This trickles down, too. I mean, there are plenty of right-wing theater kids. Transcends ideology. It's about playing a role. It's about playing a gay little part in a gay little system. And if patriots are in control, then your role goes away. If your role goes away, you go back to living a life where you're just a total loser. And where, once again, normal Americans are making you angry by virtue of their existence. Because, of course, what drives all of this is resentment. It's not altruism. It's not compassion. You can tell because these people are always like miserable and hateful, not kind and well-adjusted. People's character bleeds into every part of them. It's a pretty good indicator of their motivation for doing things. And this is not new, by the way. Lenin, the Bolsheviks, they did the same thing. I know it's become a meme at this point, like reading about the Russian Civil War, the Russian Revolution. Lenin did the same thing. Lenin recruited every group of people in Russia who had a bone to pick with the traditional establishment, the traditional higher status Russian people. And he mobilized them to destroy them in the name of equality or whatever. You open the prisons, recruit the cultists, the Satanists, sexual deviants, ethnic minorities, bitter women, everybody who may have some bone to pick with Chad. And if you had any connection to the demonized group, you have landowning ancestry, maybe in our contemporary case, you're just white. You're not getting very high up in the ranks, even if you join them, because you couldn't fully be trusted, right? You're not really on the team. You're just an ally, right? So they select for those with no stake. They select for the unproductive, the maladjusted, people with the most resentment towards the traditional nation, people with the most to gain from their displacement, from their destruction, even if it means just like doing it just to take pleasure in it because envy and resentment, again, it's not about ideology, never was, that's all window dressing. This is what your representation has looked like. The right-wing theater kids, why do we always lose? Good question. It's not that they're just incompetent. They were designed to be incompetent. They were appointed for that reason. They were selected exactly for that reason. They are the definition of controlled opposition. The neocons on our side, how so many of them have so viciously lashed out because of Trump, because he threatened to jeopardize the teat, which they rely so heavily upon. They hated Trump voters. They hated Trump. You literally would be ostracized for expressing pro-Trump sentiment back in 2015. Milo Yiannopoulos was the first mainstream, mainstream adjacent figure to sincerely vocalize support for Donald Trump. And so many of those people actually lost their minds because of Trump and they never recovered. They still have not because for a theater kid, madness, it's just like gravity. It just takes a little push. What would these people do if not that? Most of them tried to make it in Hollywood. They tried to make it as an academic, something like that. They fail. They wash up then into the pundit sphere. They need to lose because that is how they stay employed. That is their job. They're literally jobbers. They are paid to lose to make Hulk Hogan look better. They are the generals of the losing team. What happens when we win? We hold the old generals accountable. That wouldn't be so good for them, would it? They don't want to win. For that reason, exactly. So yeah, the more of a resentful loser you are, the more naturally repulsive you are, the better of an ally you are to the left. Because again, they have no other options available. There's nothing else these people can do. Doesn't matter how edgy or different or smart they think they are. When push comes to shove, they side with the establishment every time. That's why they didn't speak out uh, about censorship until they were at the top. And everyone else, between 2013 and 2017, all these people get banned. But now it's big tech censorship. It wasn't, I guess, when everyone who helped get Trump elected got banned, because you hate them anyway, but now it's big tech censorship. Now we all have to be very careful. Okay, sure. So left, right, doesn't matter. All theater kids are the same because everyone else, anything else, will want little, if anything, to do with them, and certainly less than a political operation which rewards fanatical loyalty with at least a sense of validation, I guess. You're a part of it. You're doing something. You're part of Dumbledore's army. And this works particularly well in America because there's no risk of independence for these groups. 
that the left relies on to grow and consolidate their power. They are wholly reliant upon whatever the left gives to them, whether that's literal handouts, fake jobs created with taxpayer money, free passes. It's all a patronage network. That's why they free criminals. That's why they decriminalize weird behavior. They destigmatize perversion. They reduce punishment for literally being a pedo. Uh, they identify with lower classes, promote them as though it's something to aspire to. It's all a big bat signal that says, yes, you, we want you. The worse you are, the more of an asset you are. Those are the rules. It's completely opposite to how this country was run for 400 years under wasps. It's an entirely different patronage network. It's an entirely different recruitment process, the loyalty tests, the mechanisms. It's all totally alien, and it works out very well for them. The broader right hasn't the slightest clue about it, much less how to actually fight it. And so it runs like a well-oiled machine. Because even if these people will never be truly elite or high status or even respected, Whatever making a career out of resentment for normal Americans can do for them is still probably the best case scenario. And they are very conscious of this at all times because, again, they are deeply insecure and neurotic people. They are rewarded for their malice towards you. So if you want the malice to stop, you have to disrupt the rewards for the theater kids. Fire all theater kids. Long term, prevent the creation of them altogether. Shut the faucet off. Think about what breeds a theater kid. Think about that unique kind of resentment and mediocrity. They are biologically, spiritually, mentally disrupted people. Like any pathogen, it can never be completely eradicated, but we can reduce the spread. We can stop the spread of theater kids in 999 out of 1,000 cases by getting poisons out of the food, out of the water, fertilizer, pesticides, clothes, uh, cosmetics, basically everything else. We can bring back scouting organizations for young men. We can stop the flow of demented and evil programming into the American living room or directly into these kids' phones. We can get the woke out of the schools. We can get the woke out of the churches, cut more funding to arts programs, at schools who gives a shit we can return <laughs> we can return to a state without theater kids it is possible it is possible to believe it can be done we don't have to live like this but even more important we have to get the patriots in control because there need to be rewards for patriots all for one one for all right you have to provide rewards that are attractive to high quality people who generally agree with what we're trying to do which is stop the world from killing itself not everybody's donald trump not everybody is going to take up a sword and sacrifice their quality of life simply because they're that much of a patriot that's just human nature people want their dividends that's fine we need to be able to provide that to them the same way that the left has been able to do for the last several decades there are all sorts of ways to go about doing this and one of the best places to focus attention on is, you're going to love this, meritocracy. It's going to sound a bit bland, but I assure you, it will be far more interesting in practice. We have to return to a meritocracy because if we examine everything we could do and we look in like terms of what would be the most helpful to us, what's the most politically viable, best man for the job. How can you disagree with that? Everyone thinks that's them anyway, right? But also what is already on the books? We're just healing from a brief disruption. We're restoring order. That is emitting a pulsing glow, like attack here, attack here. And the thing is, the conservative movement as it exists now, it's fair to say, was founded precisely to oppose the fruits of the civil rights movement. That's what big government means. It's plausible deniability. Well, no, I just, I just mean efficiency. Yeah, right. Bloat, efficiency, yada, yada. That's what I would say too, I suppose. But of course, there are problems, you know, when the movements are uh, sort of granted permission to exist by the regime. And then anybody who actually understands what's going on is purged because they threaten the status and the standing of the guys who want to keep going to the fancy cocktail parties. You know, I've got a whole video prepared on exactly this, the history of conservative cancel culture and purges. Let me know if you want to see that. But the point all being, if you want to dismantle their power, if you want to disrupt theater kid occupied government, declare war on the Civil Rights Act, HR departments, etc. And we're heading in the right direction. People are talking about this. Mainstream figures are openly criticizing the civil rights movement, openly criticizing Martin Luther King and now facing, facing no consequences for doing so, which people were absolutely terrified to do just a few years ago. Of course, maybe a few years ago, we showed them actually the water's fine. Hey, it's all good and we're happy to have you in the pool. It's moving in the right direction. And look at it this way. The very fact that a return to meritocracy would be so strongly in our favor is precisely why it was destroyed in the first place. Now, instead, it's literally illegal to hire people based on merit. Instead, what is selected for is fanaticism and maladjustment and mediocrity, people who cannot succeed by themselves, people who need this, people who resent those who don't, all of these different interest groups who all have a bone to pick with normal American patriots, and you can be sure they do. There's always a reason to hate Chad. It's Cain and Abel. It's high school never ends. They have to work for the state, or broadly the regime. 
because the state is the opposite of that, you know, open world bootstrap your way into being something existence, which otherwise they would fail at. So yeah, if you can't be something, just tear down everyone else who can be. Literally the plot of the most right-wing movie I have ever seen, The Incredibles, killing off the naturally gifted so you can LARP as their equal because you're just like mad that you didn't have what it takes in the first, I don't know. You have to disrupt the mechanisms that reward the theater kids. You need to destroy the theater kid factories, the theater kid supply lines. You need to attack the mechanisms which prevent or discourage normal Americans from adopting anything that is considered threatening to the regime, even if they themselves are not, you know, a part of it or really supporting it uh, in any real way. It doesn't matter because, again, just as people who have no other options are the perfect candidate for the establishment, people who do have other options, well, they have something to lose. They're not necessarily jumping out of bed to risk losing all that against the most sophisticated power apparatus ever constructed. You know, maybe an interesting example of this actually could be during the first Trump administration, during the hiring process. A lot of people who were independently successful in practicing law, business, et cetera, weren't exactly looking to jump right into staining a resume or a reputation because of association with something that, even when occupying the highest office in the nation, was considered low status, considered an irritant in an otherwise functioning system which exists solely to constrict the country to death. Granted, it's not nearly as bad now as it was then, eight, nine years ago. We will discuss all of this so soon, but we have to meet people where they are. It's not enough, unfortunately, to expect that people will just do it out of the goodness of their hearts. I wish that was true. I wish everybody was just a true believer and they would just do it, but it's just not a pragmatic way of viewing the world. You have to prioritize disabling the mechanisms that punish people for adopting anti-regime identities, basically just being normal, and also for adopting anti-regime opinions, again, just basically being normal. And just as importantly as that, you have to disable the mechanisms that create more of these people, that program these attitudes into people's heads in the first place, be that K-12 education, popular media, it's gonna all be done legally, it's all in the books, we just have to do it. You know, people love theorizing and winking about how things actually work, it's always just, you know, playing connect the dots with a bunch of different names and places and things like that. It's a lot more enticing than what it actually is, which is just this, a very brief and rather undetailed summary, but it is this nonetheless. It is an entire patronage network that takes your tax dollars and basically puts up a big welcome sign for the least talented, most maladjusted, most neurotic people in society, uh, while simultaneously creating more of that stock of people, whether by direct importation from the third world, by putting chemicals in the food, water, clothing, cosmetics, all things that disrupt natural development, that disrupt hormones, media programming from infancy, associating everything anti-regime as low status, low status, low status all the time, and then people who are insecure, rightfully so, frankly, have you seen them? They respond to that because they, of course, depend on permission for their status. It is a revocable and subjective license, and they think, okay, well, that's me, I, I agree with that, and then all those people are directed to channel that resentment towards you. It is their life mission. They are barnacles clinging to the hull of the SS gay. This is your enemy. This is the theater kid. It wants to destroy you. It wants to write a song about you and perform it at Denny's. You cannot allow this. You cannot allow this to happen, patriot. You have to become who you are. You have to be the one who performs at Denny's. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications so that you are notified in the event that I post, which is so frequent, you don't want to miss out on it, and then also share the video with a friend. Um, the content, I better batten down the content hatches, I'll tell you, I gotta nail this stuff to the, to the desk here, there's gonna be so much content you wouldn't even know what to do with it. You may, you may even get tired of content, you'll say no more, please, we don't want any more. The baby birds need to be fed. That's the bottom line. When have I abandoned? Well, don't answer that. When have I? I'm still alive, okay? We're still going. The heart's still beating. We're going to make America great again. Okay. Um, anyway, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless America.